Thank you for the beautiful worship time. So good to hear everybody singing behind me as I'm sitting in the front. It's awesome. Children, so awesome to have you here this morning too. But you can go to your kids' programs now. Have a lot of fun. Go. You can go. Yes, absolutely. Go. Come on, go down. You don't want to hear me for the next 45 minutes to an hour, that's for sure. <laughs> Anyways, go on down, kids. Enjoy. It's awesome having you and having young families here. All the different age groups and demographics that make up this church is fantastic. <clears throat> there are just some people in the Bible that we can truly identify with. Think about, for example, Peter. The Apostle P Peter, the impetuous, action-minded man who often speaks or acts before he even thinks about it. Anybody can relate to that. <clears throat> or what about Martha? Dear Martha, who invites Jesus over to her home and decides to put on this amazing feast for this distinguished guest. And she's busy, nonstop in the kitchen, putting this great meal together. But what is her sister doing? Her sister decides to be lazy, doesn't lift a finger to help Martha out. And all she's doing is sitting at the feet of Jesus. And she complains about Mary. Sometimes you feel like that. Can you identify with that? Or what about Thomas? Oh, beloved Apostle Thomas. He thought Jesus was the one that was going to be the Messiah that's going to rescue them from being under the Roman thumb. But instead it was Jesus that was crucified by the Romans. All his hopes are dashed. And then three days later he hears from his other disciples, that Jesus, we've seen him. He's risen. But what does Thomas say? Uh, 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 uh. Seeing is believing. I'll believe it when I see it. How many people can relate to Thomas? Then there is <clears throat> Habakkuk. Habakkuk. He has a conversation with God that maybe many of us can identify with, can relate to. Because maybe we've had similar kinds of conversations with God at least once in our life. But let me set the stage for Habakkuk so we can get a better understanding of what we're about to read through this strange prophet and the powerful messages, in fact, that he has for us. He's a prophet of God in the land of Judah. If you remember, Judah is now part of the southern kingdom, um, Jerusalem being its capital. And then you have the northern kingdom known as Israel, Samaria being its capital. He was a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah. And he's fully aware of what happened in Israel by now. For in 722 BC, he knows that this evil empire, the Assyrian empire, came in and held captive the Israelites in the northern kingdom, this evil nation. No matter how many times God tried to warn his people through all these prophets that he sent to the northern kingdom, turn back, repent, return back to the Lord, they ignored him and they're receiving the just consequences of ignoring God. And now a hundred years have passed since that time and Judah actually Habakkuk has experienced a season of, of great joy and of a wonderful and beautiful time in Judah. Josiah is their king, a godly leader, instrumental in bringing uh, Judah back to the Lord. He purged the city of all the cultic practices, even removing the high places from there and restoring worship back into the central location of Jerusalem. Josiah, just one of the most uh, profoundly uh, uh, great leaders reforming Judah's history in amazing ways. Habakkuk lived during that peaceful and beautiful time. But now it's 609 B.C. Josiah was killed in action and his son Jehoaz became king. But his kingship lasted only about three months. For you see, the king of Egypt came down, invaded Judah, deposed Jehoahaz, and placed his brother Jehoiakim on the throne. 
and Jehoiakim, it's almost like a broken record, some good kings, some bad ones. Jehoiakim, he was a bad dude. Evil, ungodly, rebellious Jehoiakim was not worthy of being a successor to someone like his dad, Josiah. 2 Kings 24 describes him as a tyrant who shed innocent blood in Jerusalem. Jeremiah described him as an unjust and brutal despot whose chief interest was in the sumptuous enlargement of his palace. In fact, he's the only king that ever did the unthinkable. He killed one of the prophets of God, Uriah. How dare he? This once beautiful city became ugly, full of violent, greedy, and unjust people. And here comes Josiah, and he decides to have a conversation with God. A conversation with God that many, many of us have probably had with the Lord at least on one occasion in our lifetime. Let's listen, and if we can identify, relate to Habakkuk's first set of conversations, more like an interrogation with God. Habakkuk 1, verse 2. How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. I'll cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Habakkuk is just pouring it all out to God. Dumping it all out, all his thoughts and feelings. He sees the evil and injustice being perpetuated amongst his own people, amongst the children of God in his own city. And he knows for sure that God sees all that is going on and is fully aware of it, yet God is... He's doing nothing about it. No punishment, no discipline, no setting them straight, nothing. From, from Habakkuk's opening words, we sense that this ugliness has been going on for a little while. And in fact, he's probably been pleading and coming before God, crying out to him to intervene for some time as well. But God's inactivity has caused Habakkuk to question God on so many levels. Let me try to paraphrase it and see again if you can relate to what Habakkuk was crying out and questioning God on. Verse 1 alone was, I've cried out to you for so long, God. I've cried out to you to help. You're the only one that has the ability to help in this situation, God. Uh, I, I've, I've gotten nothing back from you, though. It's empty. I'm hitting a brick wall, Lord. You're silent. Do you even care? Do you even see what's going on? Are you paying attention to me, Lord? Can you relate? The next couple of verses, you see Habakkuk, if I can paraphrase, Lord, I've, I've seen so much injustice, so much immorality, conflict and wrongdoing and violence, Lord, and you seem to tolerate it. In fact, Lord, I see the wicked attacking the righteous and, and you're doing nothing about it. All of Habakkuk's interrogations, all of Habakkuk's questions, just in those few verses, can be wrapped up, can be captured in one of those two, one of two big questions that sometimes we come before the Lord with. One of two big questions. See if you've ever asked these questions of God. First, God, where are you? Where are you, God? I feel so alone. I feel so abandoned. I feel like... We've just got this chasm between us. Where are you, God? Or you might have come before the Lord and said, God, why aren't you doing anything about this? Why aren't, aren't you doing something about all of this that I'm just presenting before you, Lord? Or all the stuff I see around the world. Why are you not doing something about this? So where are you, God? Or why aren't you doing something about this? Have you ever asked that of God? Have you ever come before God with such brutal honesty, pouring out your heart before him? If you never have, if you never have, there's one of two reasons. One is because your life is absolutely perfect. Raise your hand. 
I mean, you are absolutely blessed beyond measure. I mean, health, wealth, prosperity, you name it, your life is perfect. That's why you've never come before God in that way. Or the second reason maybe you've never come before God in that way is because you wonder if maybe a good and mature, godly Christian should never be angry at God in that way, should never question God in that way. Yet you see somebody like Habakkuk, a prophet of God who does that. Then you look at people like Moses and Job, or what about reading through the Psalms of David or Asaph? You know that you've got good and godly people who've done those very things, having brutally honest conversations with God, hard questions directed at Him. And can I tell you something? When you enter in that kind of conversation with God, into that journey with God, it actually can strengthen your faith and draw you closer to Him. I've seen that from my own personal experience. We're going to see that from Habakkuk later on, including many other Christians who've experienced the same too, as well. It will draw you closer to increase your faith in Him. But here's what I've also noticed, the flip side of that same coin. If you choose not to come before God in such brutal honesty, pouring out your heart to Him, I've seen it happen far too many times or people who choose to ignore or suppress their true feelings before God eventually experience this tension within them that what they're experiencing in life doesn't seem to mesh with who they know God to be. And in this tension, eventually they choose to be so disillusioned they walk away from God. I love how one commentator put it. Listen to these words. He sums it up really well. Human nature tends to be filled with complaints, but human beings typically complain in the wrong direction. For example, we tend to talk about God rather than talk to Him. We tend to complain about God rather than complaining to Him. And if all we do is talk and complain about God, then eventually we'll stop wanting to ever talk to Him in the first place, leading to an abandonment of our relationship with Him Habakkuk chose to confront God with these hard questions of life, and we ought to as well, to be honest in our prayers, dump our burdens on the Lord, share our frustrations and confusion. It's good and healthy for our soul, our mental well-being, our faith, and our relationship with God. Now, how's God going to respond to Habakkuk's, in some of your Bibles it's right, Habakkuk's complaint. How's God going to respond to Habakkuk? What God is about to tell Habakkuk is going to be absolutely shocking. The bottom line is Habakkuk would have never ever imagined that God is going to respond to Habakkuk's complaint in this way. That God was actually do what he was about to tell Habakkuk he's going to do. Let's see what was so bad, so shocking in God's response to Habakkuk. Verse 5. Even a start, God even starts off by preparing him. <laughs> Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. He prepares him. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to sweet, seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry, cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly in an eagle swooping to devour. They all come content on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at fortified cities by building earthen ramps. They capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on. Guilty people whose own strength is their God. Did you catch this absolutely shocking response from God? 
God told Habakkuk that he's going to deal with this pervasive uh, evil and injustice happening in Judah. How is he going to deal with it? Well, he's going to send a nation that is far more unjust, far more evil, far more brutal, far more uh, uh, awful, far more ungodly. He's going to send that nation to come and punish and discipline and destroy Judah. This is where internally you're going, are you kidding me? <laughs> Say what? Habakkuk was the one that was calling in the first place for judgment upon his people, for God to do something and deal with this perpetual evil that was going on, this abhorrent sins. Habakkuk was the one. And then God tells Habakkuk, I'm going to deal with it, <laughs> but in a way that you wouldn't ever have expected. How many can relate to that? Tell me when you've ever asked God to intervene in your life in a particular situation, and he does, but in a very unexpected way. How many of us have poured out our hearts before God and come before him asking, making prayer requests, and he does not answer the way that you had hoped he would answer? in a very unexpected way. Here are some examples. You pray for healing for someone only later on to know that they passed away. You pray for peace and love in your home only to experience continued anger and hatred and division. You pray for freedom from anxiety and from depression only for it to keep getting worse. You pray for financial health only to experience unexpected expenses, or worse yet, you lose your job. You pray for that soulmate to come in your life, only to remain single still for several more years. So how will Habakkuk respond to this unexpected, and dare I say even unwanted, response from the Lord? How will Habakkuk respond? Chapter 1, verse 12. Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. Lord, you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet, for by his net he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying the nations without mercy? Chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand and watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me, what answer I am given to this complaint. You could picture all of Habakkuk almost like this courtroom scene where God is the judge. And in the first few verses, Habakkuk states his case before God the judge. But then Habakkuk does the unthinkable. He calls the judge God to the witness stand. Calls God to defend his actions. Why? Because God's actions just doesn't seem to mesh with his character. And he, he starts, you can picture it, God at the witness stand and Habakkuk coming up close, asking questions like, God, is it not true that you are a holy God 
Is it not true, God, that you are our rock in whom we can stand securely, in whom you're supposed to be our protector, our Savior? Is that not true of you, God? Is it not true of you, God, that your eyes are just too pure to look upon evil and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing? Then, God, why? Why would you tolerate the treacherous nation of Babylon? Why is it you're allowing the wicked to swallow up the ones who are more righteous than them? Why would you let them capture your people like fish are captured? Captured in the net. Lord, why? Why are you okay with nations destroying your own people without mercy? There is your courtroom interrogation. And then you can picture after he's done with all that questioning of God on the witness stand, you can picture Habakkuk stepping away and he's going to sit at his table like a lawyer does, waiting for God's rebuttal. How will God answer Habakkuk? And will Habakkuk be satisfied with God's response? How will the story end? Come back next week for part two. But in the meantime, we learn a lot from just these first chapter that we can apply even in our lives today. I encourage you to even apply it in your lives this week. What's going on in your life? What's going on in our world that maybe today, this week, you can just have that brutally honest conversation with God? Pour out your thoughts, all your feelings. Are there things going on in your life or in this world that just don't seem to mesh, don't seem to coincide with God's character? God, you promised to be my provider, yet it seems like I can't scrub two pennies together or two nickels together. God, you say you're a good God, but when was the last time I saw goodness in my life? God, you say you're a healer, yet I've prayed so many times for this person in my family, my wife, my children, whatever it is, to be healed, and nothing. Choose this week, if you've never done it, or it's been too, so long since you've done it, will you choose this week to have that Habakkuk-like conversation with God? Maybe even need to write it down. That's what I do. I love journaling. Because my mind as an extrovert, I, I have to process things while talking it out loud. But sometimes when I'm just my, myself talking with God, I find that my mind gets distracted going to different places. So I write it down in a journal. Years and years and numbers of journals that have stacked up of crying out my prayers before the Lord and my confusion, my interrogation of God. You can write it down. And then you know what you're going to do after that? You do what Habakkuk did in chapter 2, verse 1. You wait and you listen for God's response. And that's the hardest part, isn't it? Because it requires silence and patience. And when he responds, write it down so you don't forget, then process it some more. But here's my strong warning, encouragement, reminder I want to give you. Please, in that time of being brutally honest before God, having that Habakkuk-like conversation, I encourage you to please remember to pray that the Holy Spirit would use this time to increase your faith in God, to draw you closer to God. Because you see, this story reminds me of another one. uh, A fork in the road that some disciples faced 600 years later. If you remember the story where Jesus fed the 5,000 and they're all happy and full. And then all the disciples hopped on a boat and made their way over towards Capernaum. Jesus stayed behind. And then if you remember the story, Jesus walked on water and got into the boat later on and they landed in Capernaum. Next morning, the crowd of 5,000 woke up and realized Jesus had gone. 
So they found out that he was in Capernaum, and they went there, and they started asking Jesus questions. Jesus, how can we be saved? They didn't like his answer. So then they challenged him to perform a miracle like Moses did. And then Jesus responds back with teachings about himself that they found very hard to understand, very hard to believe. How will these people respond? Will it draw them closer to Jesus or will they walk away? John chapter 6, verse 60, we pick up the story on hearing it. Many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. And he went on to say, this is why I told you that no one come to me unless the Father has enabled them. Verse 66. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And you can picture Jesus turning towards his 12 disciples. Verse 67, you don't want to leave me too, do you? And Peter's beautiful and brilliant response, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Some walked away, and then Jesus turned to his disciples and asked, Will you walk away, Lord, to whom shall we go? If we choose to turn away from Jesus, when we enter into these hard, good, difficult, but necessary conversations with God, if we don't like the answers that we're getting from him or hope to get it from him, if we're experiencing the unexpected or the unwanted, you'll have a choice to make. In that moment, will you choose to walk away from Jesus or will you run towards him even more? Will you allow to increase your faith and draw closer to him? And if not, then to whom shall you go? Who is the one that is the Holy One like Jesus Christ? No one. Who is the one that holds the key to eternal life? No one but Jesus. Who is that rock who offers us security and gives us the gift of salvation? Only Jesus does. You see, no matter how incomprehensible life's challenges can be, how difficult it is for us to swallow God's answers in our lives, no matter how difficult our struggles can be in life, no matter how many enemies might try to attack us, you must choose, ye today, whom will you follow? And remember this. None of what we're experiencing in life can even come close to what Jesus experienced the most incomprehensible event in history, the blood-dripping, limping body of Jesus Christ on the cross, the perfect and holy one, choosing to hang there for you and for me, receiving the judgment of God so that we don't receive it just by believing and receiving him in our life and choosing to say, I will follow you. So maybe this week, Will you choose to have, if you think you need it, that Habakkuk-like conversation with God and may it draw you so much closer in understanding him, loving him, and having a stronger faith in him. Father, thank you so much for what we've learned from your word. And there is more to learn. The second part of Habakkuk and conversation with you and yours with him. And thank you, God, that you are willing and even, may I even say, desiring to have these kinds of honest conversations with your children, with us. And we're so thankful that when we come before you, You're not a heavenly father that says, how dare you say those things to me? How dare you put me on the witness stand? <laughs> You're this benevolent, gracious, loving, 
Heavenly Father that I can picture choosing to even leave the witness stand and sit beside Habakkuk and put your arm around his shoulder and be able to say to him, son, let's keep talking. We'll get through this. And Father, you know the different situations that people are facing in their lives in this room or those who are watching online or those who will watch later. You know all the good that is going on and all good gifts come straight from you. And we give you thanks and praise. We also know some of the tension, the struggles that every one of us are facing in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, relationally, whatever it may be. And may this week, and maybe even this afternoon when we go home or we decide to go for a walk in the park, whatever it may be, have